Welcome friends, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. This is the 17th of November 2015 and the Corbett Report's open source investigation into the Paris terror attacks is continuing with now almost 150 comments in the thread, hundreds of links, all sorts of analysis going on in there. And of course the article is being updated and revised as new information comes in. I think one of the most interesting little nuggets that has come in uh, recently is this about the suspected ringleader mastermind of the attacks Abdul Hamid Abaoud, who interestingly miraculously evaded a police dragnet in Athens in January of this year. And this relates to a Belgian raid on a residence of someone who was purported to be leading a, a, a a cell that was going to operate in uh, Vervries in eastern Belgium. They were going to start some sort of attack. The Belgium uh, authorities raided the, uh, the the house of this suspected uh, Abaoud terrorist mastermind uh, in January, but uh, they didn't catch him. He wasn't there. And then on January 16th and 17th, uh, in apparent coordination with Belgian authorities, the, Ath the Athenian, the, the Greek police, raided a, uh, an apartment in Pangradi. And uh, wouldn't you know it, the 27-year-old Belgian of Moroccan origin who trained in Syria, i.e. Uh, this Abdel Hamid Abaoud, was not in the apartment. But they did detain four or five people, and uh, it ended with the... Uh, in. in Belgium, it ended with the killing of two suspects and the arrest of a third one. The interesting part of this story is that uh, the Belgian authorities deny that the raid in Greece had anything to do with any information they had or supplied, that it was not in coordination with, with the Belgian government. So uh, it's just an interesting little back and forth going on there, and I think there will be something, I think there's, uh, it's worth digging into what that is all about, precisely because, as viewers of the Corbett Report will know, when we're talking about Brussels and Belgium, we are talking, of course, about Gladio B, the heart of NATO's Gladio operations there in Brussels. And uh, for people who don't know about that, please do go back to episode 298, Gladio B in the Battle for Eurasia. But all of that being said, and all of the information that continues to come in, and I'm, I'm, I think it is important that we be analyzing this, but all of that being said, I think we, miss, we run the risk of losing sight of the forest for all the trees of this individual event. And the forest is really basically here in this sentence. ISIS, the terrorist group in Iraq and Syria, fostered, funded, armed, equipped, and trained by the United States, its Gulf allies, Turkey, and Israel, has reportedly taken responsibility for the attacks. This is the important the most important part of this entire story, and of course the part that will not be touched in the mainstream media with a 10-foot pole, because it begs the question of where this jihadi Islamic Islam st Islamic State movement sprang from? Did it spring from whole cloth? Did it spring from the sands of the desert? Or was it fostered, funded, armed, equipped, and trained by the U.S. and its allies? C demonstrably the latter. And if you are interested, please go to the article. Every single one of these words is hyperlinked to a different source. So you can go and read more about each and every one of these things. The fostering, the funding, the arming, the equipping, the training, the protection that has gone into the rise of the Islamic State. Including, of course, let's cast our mind back to when uh, DIA chief uh, Michael Flynn uh, said in an interview that it was a willful Washington decision to foster the rise of the Islamic State. It does not get much more blatant than that. Again, that's the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and we remember that leaked memo from a few months ago that showed that even uh, three years ago, the DIA was warning of the rise of an Islamic State as an inevitable result of the policies that the White House was pursuing. Well, here we are, and here ISIS is. And now because of this boogeyman, well, what are they going to accomplish? Why are they using this terrorist proxy army in Syria? Why are they protecting it and fostering it and equipping it and arming it? It's, of course, part of the broader game plan to topple Assad, which is part of a broader game plan in and of itself. If you want more information on these people, these, these forces, these, the, the Turkish government, the Israelis, the, the U.S., its Gulf allies, why they are uh, doing what they're doing, what they're doing, go to episode 295 of the Corbett Report, who's really behind ISIS. And uh, again, there's lots of information in there about what this agenda is. And if you want to know why they are doing it, go to episode 279, who 
is really behind the Syrian war, where we look at some of the various reasons that uh, various interests have converged on this. Of course, Turkey has its uh, Kurdish uh, problem that it is using this this uh, turmoil in Syria to take care of. Uh, Israel, of course, has the plan for the greater Israel, the Zionist plan for the Middle East. Uh, the U.S. and its allies are all interested in disrupting the Iran-Iraq-Syria uh, gas pipeline deal. Uh, there's a lot of different interests that are converging in Syria, and the ISIS proxy army is just the convenient tool of those forces. And that's why, regardless of this event and uh, you know who was ultimately behind it or how, in what way, in what particular way this transpired, the ultimate point is that ISIS is a creation of the West, and it is it feeds into the logic of the situation whereby any terrorist provocation is going to necessarily lead to, well, of course, the toppling of Assad. We have to topple Assad because he's uh, the, in charge of the government that is fighting ISIS. Wait, wait, what? how does that work again? No, don't think about it too deeply. Do not think about these things. Just react viscerally and get behind the warmongers. And while you're at it, give them broad new powers, broad new policing powers to do anything they want. From later on in the article, President Hollande is now calling for French, the French Parliament to amend the Constitution. He's calling for quick action by the Parliament on new legislation that would give the government more flexibility to conduct police raids without a warrant and place people under house arrest. He said he would seek court approval for broader surveillance powers, and he called for constitutional amendments that would give more weight to security measures relative to civil liberties, which is a beautiful way of saying, give up your rights, be afraid of the boogeyman, make, we'll make everything better, don't worry, we, we failed you spectacularly here, failed in quotation marks, but don't worry, we'll take care of you next time if you just give us more power. Problem, reaction, solution. It is not difficult to understand, in fact, it's perfectly predictable. I think this is what this is really about, and I think the first and most obvious consequence of this is that the hands-off Syria movement that we saw actually come in the way of U.S., NATO, Israeli, uh, Western intervention in Syria a couple of years ago with mass demonstrations, people saying no to the proposed bombing of Syria at that time has, of course, evaporated now. And to even think about questioning any military action on Syria would be the height of thought crime in the new order. So I think that's the first and foremost priority. And then, of course, the ancillary benefits for the would-be rulers of the world to amend the constitution, not only of France, but there are similar new legislation coming along in the UK and elsewhere to try to, well, demonize encryption, for example, because, oh, those terrorists use encryption and you're not a terrorist, are you? Those terrorists breathe air and you're not a terrorist, are you? So this is unfortunately the way it's unfolding. Now, there are some interesting side issues happening here, or not necessarily side issues, but uh, for example, France to call for effective suspension of Schengen open borders, and there is a lot of talk about, well, we need to close down the borders and stop the European project in its tracks because it has failed, which seems to go exactly counter to what the globalist plan and intention has always been, which of course is to unite Europe under the EU fascist flag. Well, guess what? I think ultimately, although this looks like it could be a good development of sorts in that it puts a roadblock in the way of the globalists and their their uh, their policies to destroy any uh, possibility of localization, decentralization of power, how they want to further continue centralizing it in broad institutions like the EU. Although it seems to do that, I think ultimately this ultimately only plays into the rhetoric and into the logic of the the, the globalization of the world, whereby I think it's it will not surprise me if they come up with, no, 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 we don't need to uh, close the, the borders within Europe per se. What we need is a united one European immigration policy and a total smart grid control system so that it can track everyone in the EU as they move from place to place. It might sound like crazy Orwellian 1984 type stuff today, but I guarantee you that narrative is going to start rolling out in the near future. So... It's bad on every level, but the important point to note here is this. ISIS is a creation of the West. ISIS is the false flag. Let us not forget that, and let us confront that ultimate lie so that we can confront all the lies that stem from it.
The Paris Terror Attacks open source investigation continues at CorbettReport.com. Please follow the link from this video to join in on that conversation and help compile more information as it comes in. Stay tuned to CorbettReport.com for more updates.